All right, thank you, Gary. Um, as you said, my name is Jennifer Keaton and um, I'm a private practicing veterinarian and um, I worked on this project with Mark Hutchinson with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension this past fall um, to finish up my Master's of Public Health that I had started while in veterinary school. Um, and the Public Health Master's was through the University of Iowa College of Public Health. And um, as he said, we were looking at different mechanical mixing equipment for use during avian influenza outbreaks to compost carcasses. And we looked at both its efficacy and also the efficiency of using such equipment. So um, as most of you probably know, there's an extensive carcass composting protocol provided by the USDA, and it requires that all carcasses feed litter eggs and packaging be composted in windrows for 28 days. These windrows must sweet, reach 131 degrees Fahrenheit for three consecutive days during the two week cycles, the two two week cycles. Um, alternatively, they can also reach 110 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 consecutive days. And um, most importantly, these protocols currently do not support the use of grinding or mixing equipment due to concerns with aerosolize, aerosolization of the avian influenza virus. Um, but we felt that with the current protocols, there is potential for anaerobic pockets within the windrows due to in inadequate mixing and also the large carcass size of some birds, especially on um, turkey farms and broiler operations which could lead to possible ineffective virus neutralization um, and or prolonged composting times and higher resource costs. So our project was to determine if grinding or thorough mixing of poultry carcasses and composting ingredients could improve and accelerate tissue breakdown and if it could improve optimal temperatures for poultry carcass composting. Um, but also important to our study was to determine if there was an economical and timely way to accomplish this, um, because obviously even if our methods were superior in um, composting, if there wasn't an efficient and economical means of doing so, then it, it wouldn't be worthwhile. So again, I did this research in conjunction with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension and the Maine Compost School. So our first objective um, was to determine if using a vertical mixer, um, which is used um, to mix cattle feeds to grind and mix carcasses and feedstocks, um, or a horizontal mixer to simply mix carcasses and feedstocks, could improve poultry carcass composting um, as compared to the conventional layering method outlined in the USDA protocols. So we built several um, piles or, or treatment trials at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Compost School. Um, so this is a picture of us building the conventional layering piles. Um, we use this tractor with a um, three-quarter yard bucket um, and layered the carbon manure and birds on top of a um, base layer um, and then covered those piles with wood shavings. Um, then we built piles with the horizontal mixer. So with this method, we we put all the we put the wood chips, the used horse bedding, the poultry manure, birds, and water, load it all into the mixer wagon and allowed it to mix. Um, and then discharge this material on top of the base layer in three separate piles, and then covered that mixture with wood shavings. And then we built piles using a vertical mixer. Um, Similarly to the horizontal mixer, all the ingredients were added into the mixer and allowed to mix. Um, a couple of differences here with the horizontal mixture mixer is that um, we did not add water to this mixture. Um, we just, we forgot to add water. We did this on a separate day. Um, and then the difference, the big difference between the horizontal mixer and the vertical mixer 
is that there are blades inside the mixer that mixer that um, cut up and grind the material. Um, and another big difference that you can see here is that the discharge door was lower on this mixer. Um, so it made it kind of difficult to discharge this material into a windrow, a, a tall enough windrow. So instead of making three separate piles, we actually discharged it across the whole base layer three separate times. And, and I'll talk about the challenges with that later on in the presentation. So once the piles were formed, we began data collection. Um, we collected um, daily temperatures over the four week period at both the, um, both the 18 inch and 36 inch, inch markers on a Monday through Friday basis. And then that temperature data was presented in time versus temperature graphs. And then the second data collection, part of the data collection was um, particle size data. So on day zero, when the piles were created, day 16, when the piles were turned, and day 30, at the end of the trial, um, we collected several two gallon bucket core samples from each of the piles and then screened this material through a half inch mesh, mesh screen and weighed the material that did not pass through the screen. And we then called that data the screen weights for each of the piles and analyzed that data with um, an independent t-test with Microsoft Excel. So then again, the second part of the objective or second objective for the study was to estimate the costs for carcass composting and then compare the economics of each of these methods that we used um, and then determine if using a mixer wagon would be an economical option for poultry carcass composting. Um, I will say that this, this ended up being the most challenging part of the whole study, um, which I'll go into some of the challenges that we ran into. So the first part of, of trying to estimate costs was we, we timed how long it took to build each of these piles for each of the methods. Um, and then in order to kind of extrapolate how many birds we can process in, in a certain amount of minutes, we needed to know how many birds were in each, an, an average count of how many birds were in each three quarter yard bucket. So we could then kind of come up with, with um, estimated times to, to process X number of birds. This, is, this was the most interesting part of the research because in order to get an average number of birds per bucket load, we had to count several bucket loads of birds to get an average number of birds per bucket, um, which um, on a couple of the occasions, the birds had to be delivered several days in advance. And this was in the middle of the summer and the birds waited underneath a tarp before we got around to counting them. So thank you, Mark, for that, that interesting part of my research. <laughs> Um, so then this chart is just um, the minimum processing times for each of the, the methods for, for each um, bucket load of birds. And there was approximately 254 birds per bucket load. And then I um, just multiplied to come up with um, average minutes and then hours to process 200,000 birds using our very small system. So this was with, again, one three quarter yard loader, one tractor operator, one mixer, and one person on the ground. And that information will come, become important when I then kind of extrapolated this data for the economic costs. So then prior to starting my project, I. Mark had talked to some USDA people and, and we had hoped that I could gather some cost information from the last outbreak um, to, again, calculate economic costs. Um, but it was determined after we had started the study that this data was in large files that I did not have access to. 
and um, USDA didn't have um, the labor to be able to go into those files and get the data that I needed. Um, we also tried to reach out to Clean Harbors that was involved in the cleanup information, and and they weren't also they were not also able to provide any information. Um, so I had a long talk with um, USDA Agricultural Economist Camila Johnson, who pointed me towards their the Iowa State University's Iowa Farm Custom Rate Survey which gives kind of average rental costs for different agricultural equipment, labor rates, um, and so forth for, for different agricultural processes to try to come up with some estimated costs. And she suggested that when I came up with a cost to then multiply that by one and a quarter to one and a half to come up with kind of a high range to, to estimate for changes in supply and demand depending on how large of an outbreak we were dealing with. Um, and then I, I gained several important contacts during an avian influenza carcass compo compost training at the main compost school. I met several employee, federal employees and I gained um, a private contractor con uh, contact that was involved in a large Iowa laying hen farm outbreak. Um, and his name was Greg Albert, um, and his his experiences were interesting because they they actually used a um, tub grinder inside a manure shed to grind up the carcasses and the, the compost ingredients, um, and then loaded this mixture into a um, manure spreader to then create the piles um, and then as you can see in this picture they also use that manure spreader to turn the piles um, and he provided me with a, a plethora of information that he had recorded during his experience um, which included um, his equipment costs which included the labor and the fuel um, and um, processing times for how much, how long it took to process X number of birds. And he supplied me with his recipes used as well. So that all helped me in my economic calculations later on. Um, I also called several equipment rental places um, to try to determine how much it would cost to rent a, a vertical or horizontal mixture mixer and also important to know you know how available this equipment is because that's important to know in a large outbreak situation i did speak with an iowa equipment rental dealer that had many vertical mixers available and he said he would be willing to rent them in a outbreak and the approximate rental rate was $80 to $100 per hour. Um, then I had to kind of come up with some estimated costs for um, carbon costs, and I got some important information from Josh Payne, who was at the time at Oklahoma State University, um, and this is his chart that he provided me um, with average carbon costs and amounts per barn based on his work in Minnesota during the, the latest outbreak. So then I put all this information together, the time compost trials that we did at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, the Iowa Custom Rate Survey, um, the numbers given by Greg Elbert from the Iowa outbreak, the carbon costs from Josh Payne, Oklahoma State, and um, the cost ranges to um, estimate for changes in supply and demand as suggested by Kamina Johnson. Um, so, so now onto our results. So both the horizontal mixer and the conventional layering methods performed well for temperature, temperature data, which I'll show in the next slides. So this is the, the horizontal mixer treatment. And as you can see by day four, um, it reached above the 131 degree Fahrenheit marker um, and stayed above that for the, the duration of the trial. And then this is the conventional layering method, 
which reached 131 degrees by day five um, and again stayed above 131 degrees for most of the, the trial. <clears throat> The vertical mixer treatment did not perform as well for temperature. And this can be explained for several reasons. Um, one was that unfortunately the, the 36 inch marker thermometer was placed poorly in the piles in the beginning. Um, and we had to reset those later. I think maybe they had sunk some during the trial as well. So you can see on this day here in the middle, we, we reset those and there was about a 10 degree temperature difference. So we may have missed some higher temperatures here in the beginning. Um, but also most important was that the, temp the piles really were too dry. Um, we did not add water, unfortunately, to the mixture when we started. Um, and also the vertical mixer trial was done, was started three weeks after the, the previous two trials due to um, some challenges in getting a vertical mixer and the weather was drier during this time period as well. And then the, the other challenge was what I had mentioned earlier on was that the, the discharge door on the vertical mixer was much lower than that on the horizontal mixer um, and it made it hard to build adequately high enough piles with a nice parabolic shape that you're looking for. Um, and the piles really flattened out during the, during the trial. And so that didn't allow them to heat up as they, sh they should. Um, I did find in speaking with the Iowa equipment rental dealer that this can be remedied with an addition of a belt driven chute that can discharge material up to six feet tall. So, um, even though the vertical mixer temperatures did not meet the 131 degree Fahrenheit marker, um, it did meet the 110 degree Fahrenheit for 10 consecutive days for both cycles. And we know from other research cited here um, that virus inactivation occurs at temps um, even lower than this. And other factors are important besides heat during composting to, to inactivate the virus. And despite the temperature challenges, the vertical mixer treatment did have superior tissue breakdown um, compared to the, both the conventional layering and the horizontal mixer methods. Um, on day 30, the particle size data, um, the screen weights were much lower um, for the horizontal, uh, sorry, for the vertical mixer treatment here in gray. Um, compared to the conventional layering method here in orange and the horizontal mixer method here in blue. Um, so that was an interesting result. Um, the other thing you'll notice here is that the orange line, this is the conventional layering method, and there really was no change in the screen weights. And this can be, um, this is due to on, on day zero, the, the challenge of getting an accurate screen weight because of the presence of whole birds. So to get core samples, we took a two gallon bucket sample from the core. And so with a two gallon sample size, you're either gonna have a whole bird in it or not. And so there was a huge variance in the screen weight data for the conventional layering method on day zero. Um, because of you know either having a bird in the bucket or not so that's that wasn't a you know a great example of of the screen weight for the conventional layering method um, another important thing that we discovered in this is that for both the horizontal mixer and the vertical mixer method there was a significant decrease in the particle size in the first two weeks but no change in the, in the particle size in the second two week cycle. So we felt that this could support shortening of the current four week cycle um, to a two week cycle with turning of the piles after seven days, which could have a huge reduction in opportunity costs to producers if they could move this material 
um, out of the barns and or off of their property into storage facilities for um, later use as a soil conditioner. Um, so now the results of the economic calculations, those also did support the use of a mixer wagon for carcass composting. And I'll show the um, table on the next slide. So um, a lot of extrapolation had to come to get to these numbers. So what I did was I took the, the data that we collected um, on the farm using the three quarter yard bucket um, and then upped that equipment size to five yard buckets and made the assumption that um, if you upped the size of the equipment, you could process a larger number of birds in the same amount of time. So I calculated that you could pr approximately fit 1,700 birds in a five yard bucket um, and still process those that same number in the approximately 15 minutes it took, took us to process 250 birds um, because it would still be just one bucket load. Um, and also used at least a 24 yard mixer um, in this process as well. Um, and then um, calculated estimated carbon material costs based on the information from Joshua Payne and um, then came up with these ranges. I, I did it with manure or without manure because that changes your carbon material, obviously. Oops. Um, and so for the mixer wagon method with larger sized equipment, um, I came up with about 15 to 22,000 without manure and 25 to 37,000 with manure. Um, and then again, for the conventional layering method, I increased the number of equipment to process more birds quick, more quickly. Um, the carbon material was greater due to an increased need for carbon material to make sure that the carcasses are covered up appropriately. Um, and so the estimated costs there were 20 to 30,000 for no manure and 31 to 48,000 with manure. So as long as you're using um, large enough equipment, I, I determined that this could be an economical means for, for um, processing birds and could be more, even more economical than the conventional layering method. And then again, the, the low and the high range, the high range is just one and a quarter times the low to estimate for changes in supply and demand during a, an outbreak. So recommendations based on this, um, I, I think that we should consider using mixer wagons for poultry carcass composting during an outbreak. Um, I think more, more work needs to be done on, on determining you know, how available this equipment is and, and making sure that there's plans in place depending on you know, the area that, that the outbreak occurs in. Um, also consider shortening the compost cycle from four weeks to two weeks with turning the piles after seven days based on the data. Um, and as I just mentioned, encourage states and poultry producers to develop emergency plans to help reduce the cost of composting. Um, and so this may encourage more producers to use composting um, as a means of disposal rather than other things like burial. Um, and develop emergency preparedness plans for faster response um, and disposable disposal and reduce the spread of the virus. Um, further research obviously needs to be done though. We did not address the concern of aerosolization with use of, of this equipment. So that's something that still needs to be looked at. And um, a larger trial with a vertical mixer wagon um, with a, a, a higher discharge chute and adequate moisture could help support the research as well. Um, this article was published recently in the International Journal of One Health, um, and that's the link for that paper if anyone is interested. References. And I will take questions. Well, Jennifer, thank you.
Thank you very much. And I think most everybody on this call did receive a copy of that article. And if you didn't, uh, again, you saw the link earlier. You can uh, check with, with Jennifer or with Mark to get that a copy of that. So now we'll open it up to any questions for Jennifer about uh, the study or the process or anything else. You just need to make sure that you uh, go to your right side of your screen and click audio on in order to ask a question. Um, hi, this is Lori Miller with USDA. Uh, Jennifer, I just want to say really great job um, and thank you for presenting it to our group. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about the aerosolization, um, you know, in the future if, if that study uh, happens. And But while you were working, um, I'm wondering, did you just visually observe any differences in dust or other um, airborne particles? No, I really, I didn't really see much of a difference at all. I mean, especially, you know, if you add water to the to the mixture, there really wasn't any dust at all. And even without adding water to the vertical mixture mixer, there really wasn't any dust at all. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Well, Jennifer, this is Gary. Thank you very much for that. Um, I just briefly saw the numbers there on, on your calculations for the amount of carbon, et cetera. And I saw for your traditional uh, a layering method you had for those 200,000 birds, you had, um, I think it said 900 to 1,800 cubic yards of carbon material. Um, and, and I didn't get a chance to look at those numbers for the other mixing um, scales. But what is the, generally, what is the ratio between carbon material and nitrogen based that those calculations were based on? I'm, don't have a chance right now to, to plug those numbers in. Right. Um, it's a it's a little bit variable from what I remember. Um, again, some of that carbon material estimations were based on some information from Josh Payne that was given to me. Um, but um, the ratios were usually, I think, around one and a half to two to one. If I remember correctly. Okay, and that's that's standard for what we we're trying to do. That's good. I just the reason I was asking is because I I think you made a comment that for the standard protocol you added more material um, to make sure that everything was covered, and I was just curious about right. that. So, yeah. Um, okay, that, that's interesting. And, and now since you released this paper. There has been some additional information released from Lori's group on the cost of composting turkeys in this case in Minnesota and Iowa. So it'll be interesting to see how those numbers compare um, with the numbers that you generated here. So that will be interesting. Absolutely. So questions from the group, if there are any more questions. Uh, Jennifer, this is Bob Peer. Uh, on a, I can see that uh, well, on a large layer farm, do you envision uh, how many mixers would would you be using? Would you be just relying on one mixer uh, to keep up with the volume, or or would you use more than one mixer? Um, I guess it would depend on the size of, of the operation. Um, I think in, in my calculations, I used one mixer per 200,000 birds. Um, I do know that on the Iowa farm outbreak where they used the manure spreader and the grinder, that they had one tub grinder and then they had two manure spreaders in operation. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
and I'm just checking the chat window right now just to see if there's any questions that came in that way. And there is not. So one one final call for questions for Jennifer. Well, if there are none, Jennifer, thank you so so much. It was really fascinating. We appreciate the the research. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, um, I, we do have some time left on the call, and I would like to open it up at this point to see if there are any other um, items that we would like to discuss today. Perhaps I'll start with Lori to see if there's anything, Lori, that you would like the group to consider or to discuss. Uh, thanks, Gary. Well, uh, let me just take 